to welcome you all here today to the Poetry Center and uh, to the Distinguished Poets Series. Uh, I know that I've said this a million times, but because this is a television program now, I, I want to say it every time, uh, that the, the Distinguished Poets Series and all the other programs that we run through the Poetry Center and the Cultural Affairs Department of the Passaic County Community College are made possible by grants from the um, New Jersey State Council on the Arts, um, the NEA, uh, and also individual contributions from people who give us money uh, and become members or donors, and also by the um, support of Passaic County Community College, which provides space and uh, lots of other help for us so that we can run all the programs that we run through the Cultural Affairs Department and the Poetry Center. And I particularly want to um, thank uh, Dr. Steve Rose, who's the president of the college, who has been immensely supportive of everything we do here and all the programs that we run. And, uh, you know, I keep thinking, please don't let them go get stolen from us. <laughs> and we'll have to deal with a different president who might not be quite so supportive. So uh, in honor of Steve Rose, I, I will acknowledge that uh, he, he makes all these programs possible. I, I know that you know that Marie, Maria Fama was supposed to read here today, and uh, Maria has rheumatoid arthritis, and she had an infection, a blood infection, and the doctor felt that she was not strong enough to be able to um, sustain uh, a long day. Uh, she lives in Philadelphia and coming here and then going back to Philadelphia and being exposed to people. He was afraid she would get sicker than she already is. I'm sorry that you missed her because her, and you must get her book because she really is an amazing poet, sad and funny at the same time. Anyway, but because she could not come, I called my friend Joe Weil and said, Joe, will you do me a favor? Can you come down and do the workshop and the reading? Uh, so he came down here with his two babies, and who are adorable, you have to go look at them, and his wife, Emily, who's also a poet, and was kind enough to say that he would be part of this program today. Uh, Joe Weil was born and raised in Elizabeth, New Jersey. He's a distinguished poet who teaches at SUNY Binghamton. Weil's latest book, The Great Grandmother Light, New and Selected Poems, New York Quarterly Press, Painting the Christmas Trees, Texas Review Press, and What Remains, Nightshade Press. I, I think I read that sentence incorrectly, but anyway, those are his latest books. Uh, Weil has read in hundreds of art centers, libraries, at the Geraldine Art Dodge Poetry Festivals, and the Detroit Opera House. Weil has also appeared on PBS's Fooling with Words, um, national television special, as well as reading on Pacifica and National Public Radio. Uh, if I have to say of Joe Weil that he manages to combine uh, the language of the everyday with this kind of high culture language without ever sounding pretentious or um, like somebody who is trying to be something that he isn't. He has read an enormous amount. When you hear his poems, you can hear echoes of the people that he's read. He's one of the people I know who knows just about every poet, every major poet of the last few centuries and knows their poems by heart. Um, he also is a poet who is very close to my heart. Uh, his, his poems are, I think, truly amazing and singular and unique. And let's welcome Jill Wilde. So since this is a new and selected, and usually you come out with that when you're three quarters near dead. <laughs> yeah. So I've had enough books now. I'm going to begin with a new poem, and then I'm going to go to Ode to Elizabeth, because I would never do anything to make Maria kill me. <laughs> but this is, um, this is called Green Light. And when I was a kid, my father had two lights going. The one was the cigarette, and the other was the green light of his radio. And uh, so this poem's about that. In the dark... The green light glows from my father's radio. Outside rain and the sound of rain under 18 wheels. Along the highway, the truckers speak to each other in long, all-night draws of almost finished sentences. I think the voice of the midnight universe 
is always vaguely southern. West Virginia, North Carolina, Shiloh, Vicksburg, moving on all the way to Cleveland and down to some great swamp where dead cedars rise, where a heron barely stirs. I am thinking how pain calcifies in the heart, how great cathedrals in the cave of someone's closed eyes are being formed, drop by drop, on the limestone walls of trout streams, in the caves of Kentucky, all the way through to Pennsylvania. Is a man ever alone, stretched out upon the pallet of his bed? Is he ever less than a landscape, an outcropping of rocks, voices, wires, the sharp elbows of waitresses at 3 a.m. No one reduces me save business as usual. And if you have enough time, my father said, enough time to swallow your own spit, you might hear the universe speaking to you. It's endless patter. It's voice in the stones, a great rock along Route 81 south whose silence is song. Do not trust the junkies of that more civil silence. They are loud with their serenity, but the violent bear it away, the trucks moving along the highway in the rain. When my mother died, I crept into his room, his head down and cradled in his hands. Long ago, and long ago, and long ago, and long ago. Grief, don't let me know you cheaply. I put my arms around you, and I am not afraid. Now, there are a lot. This poem came. I published my first short story. And I went to a party in Greenwich Village. I always, well, I love telling the story more than I like reading the poems. Sometimes. And I go there, and it was a former creative writing teacher of mine who invited me to this party. And I'm talking to this girl, and I'm thinking, we're going to get each other's phone numbers. This is before I met my Emily or whatever. And everything's going to be. And I, she goes, Where do you come from? And I go, Elizabeth, New Jersey. And her face drops. And she goes, My God, stinky town. You could smell it off the turnpike. And right at, you know, never trust somebody to pronounce this guy with a W, you know, and the name Gold. And, anyway, and then, on top of that, the New York Times, because it was the chemical fires, wrote Grimy Elizabeth. So this poem came out of being pissed off. And after I wrote it, I threw it in the garbage. And my friend Dave Roscoe took it out and typed it up. And then it ended up in Maria's Magazine. And then it ended up anthologized. And I kept trying to get this poem. So this is a poem written... I guess out of anger and saying, well, you don't know a town unless you live in it. You don't know it by going out on the turnpike and smelling it. Uh, you know it by living there and smelling it. <laughs> Here it goes. <laughs> Ode to Elizabeth. Grimy Elizabeth, Time Magazine and Tones. This city escaped the race riots, never quite sank, and consequently never rose. It's not a town for poets. You live here, you work the factory or a trade. Down the burg in Peterstown, Italian bricklayers sit on stoops, boxes, chairs, playing poker until 1 a.m. Drive up Elizabeth Avenue, and you'll hear the sounds of the music blast from every window. Even the potted geraniums dance. In Lal Palmita, old Cuban guys sip coffee from little plastic cups. They talk politics, prize fights, Castro, soccer, soccer, soccer. Our mayor looks like a lesser mayor daily. Smokes cigars wears loud plaid suits, the penultimate used car salesman. He's been in since 64, a mick with a machine, they say. He's been re-elected because he's a consistent evil. And here in Elizabeth, we appreciate consistency. <laughs> Half the law of life is hanging out, hanging on to frame houses, pensions, every Sunday ethnic radio, Irish hour, Polish hour, Lithuanian hour. My father sits in the kitchen listening to Kevin Barry. He wishes he still could sing. Two years ago, they cut his voice box out. Cigarettes, factory, 30 years worth of double shifts. My father's as grimy as Elizabeth, as sentimental, as crude. He boxed in the Navy bantamweight. As a kid, I'd beg him to pop a muscle and show off his tattoo. We are not the salt of the earth. I've got no John Steinbeck illusions. I know the people I love have lousy taste in furniture. 
They are likely to buy crushed velvet portraits of Elvis Presley and hang them next to the Pope. They fill their lives with consumer goods, leave the plastic covering on sofas and watch, let's make a deal. They are always dreaming the lottery number that almost wins. They are staunch Democrats who voted for Reagan. They are, they are laid off, laid off when singers close, stuck between chemical dumps and oil refineries in a city where Alexander Hamilton went to school. In the graveyard by the courthouse, like Haldwells, Ogdens, Boudinots, Milton is quoted on their graves. Winos sleep there on summer afternoons under hundred-year-old elms. They sleep there on the slabs of our founding fathers and snore for history. I have no illusions. We belong. The winos, the immigrants, the prospering Portuguese with their sweet-looking daughters all marching off to law school and leaving their parents' broken English behind. The Irish of Curry had have vanished, but up in Elmora you still can see the Jewish families walking home from synagogue. They are devout. They are well-dressed. They read the Talmud. They are not full of shit. Twelve years ago, I used to go to the Elmora Theater with 20 other kids. It was a rundown movie house that never got the features till they'd been out a year. Because the Elmora was poor, it showed foreign films, art films. We didn't know were art. Fellini, Wertmuller, Bergman, it cost a dollar to get in. We'd sit there, factory workers' kids, half hoods, watching Amacord, while in the suburbs they played all that other crap. When the grand, uh, the uncle climbed the tree in Amacord and screamed, I want a woman! We all agreed. For weeks, Anthony Bravo went around school screaming, I want a woman! Every chance he got. I caught my first feel there, saw Hester Street, the seduction of Mimi. Once they had a double feature, Bruce Lee's Fists of Fury with Igmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal. I remember 200 kids exploding when Jack Nicholson choked the nurse in Cuckoo's Nest. Sal Rotolo stood up, tears streaming down his face, and when they took Jack's soul away, we all sat there silent and sad. It lingered with us all the way home. Here in Elizabeth, this tasteless city, where Amacord was allowed to be just another flick, where no one looked for symbols or sat politely through the credits. If art moved us at all, it was with real amazement. We had no frame of reference. And so I still live here, because I need a place where poets are not expected. I would go nuts in a town where everyone read pound, where old ladies never swept their stoops or poured hot water on the ants. I am happiest in a motley scene, stuck between Exxon and the Arthur Kill. I don't think Manhattan needs another poet. I don't think Maine could use me. I'm short. I'm ugly. I prefer Mrs. Paul's fish sticks to black and red fish. I don't like to travel because I've noticed no matter where you go, you take yourself with you, and that's the only thing I'd care to leave behind. So I stay here. At night, I can still hear mothers yelling, Michael, supper, get your ass in gear. Where nothing is sacred, everything is sacred. Where no one writes, the air seems strangely charged with metaphor. In short, I like a grimy city. I suspect culture, because it's been given over to grants, credentials, and people with cute haircuts. I suspect poetry, because it talks to itself too much, tells an inside joke. It has forgotten how to pray. It has forgotten how to praise. Tonight, I write no poem. I write to praise. I praise this motley city of my birth. I write to be a citizen of Elizabeth, New Jersey. Like some goddamned ancient Greek, I stand for this smallest bit of ground, my turf, this squalid city, here in the armpit of the beast. Tonight, the ghost of Ogden's, Caldwell's, Boudinot's walk among the winos. They exist in the salsa music blaring on Elizabeth Avenue. They rise up and kiss the gargoyles of Cherry Street. They are like King David, dancing naked and unashamed before the covenant. Tonight, even the stones can praise. The Irish dead of Curry Head are singing in their sleep. And I swear, the next time someone makes that face, gives me that bite the lemon look, as if to say, my God, how can you be a poet and live in that stinking town? My answer will be swift. I'll kick him in the balls. <laughs> So 
So as I mentioned in a little too my father had a laryngectomy and his voice box cut out, which is a shame. It's a terrific tenor voice. And um, shortly after that, I had to quit college and get a job because right, he was sick. And he cried. He didn't want that to happen. He, they get a stoma. He was dabbing with a tissue. And he hands me these two bills, making sure I, I got a good lunch when I went to work. And, but the poem will explain it. That's what this poem, The First Time I Got Up Early, is about. The first time I got up early and put my work boots on and knew that they meant work. I was 19, freshly dropped out of college. And I came downstairs to join my father in the kitchen. He'd lost his larynx the year before, had learned to belch out words without a voice box. He stood there in his white stone products uniform, and I stood there in my work boots, and he just cried. His stoma, that hole they leave you with when they cut a larynx out, filled up with mucus. He had to dab it with a tissue. He said nothing but put two soft bills from his wallet, took them out, and handed them to me. Later, when I came home, Machine grease in my pores, stinking of coolant mist and sweat. He offered me a beer. Here, kid, he belched. My father, 55 years old, reduced from grade A machinist to janitor, the guy who cleaned the toilets, cancered and canceled. He said, work's just work. Only the bosses get to call it a career. We sat for an hour on the porch letting the tiredness drink us, the warm night touch us with its fur. He said, I'm sorry. I said, what are you sorry for? And he didn't answer, just opened another beer. I wanted to kiss him, but I didn't. There were these blanks between us, as beautiful and as hopeless as the sky. There were these blanks, and what could we have filled them with? Later, when he was too drunk to walk, I helped him up the stairs, took his work shoes off, cleaned the snot from his throat hole, covered him with a blanket. This was love. I meant it, silent, and knowing it could kill me. I took my time. I'm doing a lot of stuff. I wrote so many poems about my mother, and I was never satisfied with any of them because I loved her. She was an amazing person. But my father, some, that was the more troubled relationship, so it's easier to write the poems, you know. But um, I'll just read this one, Teaching the Dead for my mother, and then I'll move on to it. Come on, I will teach you how to pray. Now that you're dead. Now that you sweep the grave's floor with the fringes of your nightgown and beg the moon for one last drink, I will teach you the alphabet of my body. This is what we've always been doing, this love grown outward like a prayer, this language that's a necklace of bear's teeth, a bracelet of whalebone, this life gone north from the eyes. We who are always coming and going, who are only a little while here must dance. I will teach you the round stones of memory, the moist palms in which they hide. Guess which hand I hold my grief in, and the space will open up between us. This is a wound that freely opens. Two coins for your eyes, Ma. Two coins and an old black shoe heel to toss into this dark street. The light's just coming on. So that's for her, but um, I should do, I'm not doing love, I, I know, you know, what the, um, I just feel like I give her short shrifts. So I'm not really doing it because there's four poems for her in this book, but I just didn't think of reading them today. I don't know how much more time I'll do a you couple. Time. Okay. Because I want to do one for my wife. I do everything ass backwards in life. I, I graduated college after I was 40. All right, and I had children after I was 50. <laughs> All right, so those are my two, and got married then. You know, so, you know, my wife is a very calm person, and uh, I'm a very, 
I, Maria will tell you. I've never met a, a, an act of catastrophe I couldn't sit down with and make friends with. <laughs> so, I, so this is a poem about that. It's called Glass of Water because I, I trusted nothing. You know, my parents died when I was almost a teenager, and I had every rug that you could imagine pulled out from under me. So you kind of get to the point where you only trust disasters, which is a bad place to be. My wife's taken me from that place, so God bless her. Glass of water. My wife is calm, even in the midst of Armageddon. As for me, I never met a form of hysteria I didn't like. <laughs> the world is always falling apart. I took nine different homeless people in over three years, four of which were from Westchester and were only temporarily broke on their way to six-figure incomes and a European tour. I feel sorry for the rich as well as the poor. My father told me to pray for the rich. Pray for them. They starve their kids, he said. Look how skinny they are. And those poor little bastards never get second helpings. Why do you want to live to be 90, my father said. You'll be shitting in a diaper, and some poor lady from Haiti will have to roll you over and over again. I love my wife. Lately, I've been considering lifting weights, giving up red meat, cutting down on smokes. When we almost bounced at the bank and I was pulling out what little hair I had, she said... You smell like cinnamon. Kissed my shoulders. Derailed my rage. I teach her the names of birds and of wildflowers. She is taking her crowbar of love and prying my fingers loose from mistrust. It isn't easy. I don't trust the ground underneath me. I've been there when it collapsed. I don't trust the Dow Jones or the soft pillow under my head or sometimes even her love. Late at night, when the ghosts of my parents walk across the kitchen floor, when I am weeping because the losses are in, not of, a loss in things, she rolls over from a dream, clamps me to the bed with her legs, says hi. It is 2 a.m. She goes to bed at 10 and sleeps till 10. I go to bed at 2 and sleep until 5. We are in different shifts. Having Googled the ostrich and Tony Curtis and Lisbon and Garcia Frederica Lorca, I try to lie down again beside her. I hold her, head like a football in my arms. She buries her face in my chest. I say, I'm so afraid, Emily. I'm not used to anything that stays. I don't know what to do with staying. She says, shut up and get me a glass of water. And this is when I wrote, when my, my daughter, I have insomnia, my daughter, Claire, was still in her mother, so to speak. I would stay up late at night, watch shows. When she was newborn, we'd watch TV together. TV, late night, in America, is a very strange world of Sylvester Stallone doing incredibly bad things from airplanes. <laughs> Excuse me. And I said, this is a frightening world, but this is love poem for my daughter, Claire. That, this isn't that poem, though, so can't sleep again. Tonight with my wife, when my wife went out, I stayed home with my daughter, and we lay on some pillows on the living room floor and watched TV, mostly old shows. She is making sounds all the time now, and I love it. She talks with her hands. I give her a shot of formula, and then I swig my water. We lie there, and she jabbers away at me. After she and my wife both fall asleep, I wish my life could always be this simple and this clean. I am not the same person anywhere on earth that I am with my daughter. It is overwhelming, and sometimes it frightens me. Outside, there is all that dark. The buds of the trees are so tight and full of promise. And yet everything teeters. It's both on the brink of spilling and of being spilled. I saw a purple finch today. I whispered this fact to my daughter as she jabbers away to everyone loves Raymond. She will never remember that I whispered purple finch to her. I want the love I feel for my daughter to be like the artwork done by the artisans in the eaves of Chartres. They did their best carvings where no one but God would ever see them. I tell her, 
Someday you'll not know I love you. Someday you'll take me for granted or even piss on me. And so I embrace being lost to memory and to sight so that even the dark can love you and the tight buds of the trees and it doesn't matter. All this love grown outward like a prayer, it will endure until I am erased in you. And you are erased in whatever you choose to love. I am so incredibly, impossibly overwhelmed and grateful that you exist upon this earth. I'll do one more poem and then I'm out of here. Um, I worked in a factory. I was the first aid attendant, and there were a lot of illegal aliens that worked there. They became my friends. And the INS came in one time, and uh, a, a guy jumped from a, he fell from a, he was trying to hide from a forklift that it was up, and he broke both his legs. And it was the one time in my life I came very close to being arrested for a very, what was considered actually a federal offense. It's called obstructing justice. In the factory, the INS would come wearing their brand name, INS, and catch the illegals who were in the act of almost making a living. Fat Jose fell from the forklift basket some 20 feet and broke his legs, lay writhing on the oil-soaked floor. And I thought how they had broken the legs of the thieves but left Christ's bones intact because he was already dead. And I thought how I would like to kill everyone in a suit and all Christian Republicans and the elitist leftists in the academy who prattle on about globalization and make me ashamed for ever having read a book, and the bored students I saw sipping espressos in Hoboken cafes who had no idea and wouldn't have cared how deadly their boredom is. But there were not enough bullets for my rage, and so I killed no one, but knelt beside Fat Jose, who was out of his mind with pain, drooling, the bone of his left leg jutting out from his work pants, his wallet containing a picture of his daughter in a communion dress, three wrinkled singles, and a false ID. This pudgy father, this criminal. And being the first aid attendant and the shop steward and the idiot in residence, I refused to let them cuff him and told the INS to go fuck themselves. Stared at the bright letters on their chest, these clowns of law, and nothing ever felt more right to me than when they threatened to arrest me for obstructing justice. It was better than the sweetest sex, and I was still saying, F you, F you, when the foreman dragged me away. I don't have to do that kind of work anymore, thanks to Maria, but I don't forget either. So I'll end with a song. Is that all right? Do I have that? Okay. Yeah, but read painting the Christmas trees first. Really? Uh, people have heard me. They're sick. Yeah. Okay. This is one I wrote when I was in the factory. I mean, painting the Christmas trees. I had a job painting the ends of Christmas trees. Back then, they used to stick them in. They had different colors. And everybody would get high because they didn't give you masks, so you would be painting. So you're there drunk and high, and your lungs are ruined, and you're painting these Christmas trees. You know? So that people can have a very holly jolly Christmas. So let me find that poem, Painting the Christmas Trees, 104. All right. Um, here it goes. In my odyssey of dead-end jobs, cursed by whatever gods do not console, I end up at a place that makes fake Christmas trees. Thousands, some pink, some blue, one that revolves ever so slowly to the strains of silent night. Sometimes, out of sheer despair, I rev up its RPMs and send it spinning wildly through space, Dorothy Hamill disguised as a balsam fir. I run a machine that spits paint onto wire boughs, each length of boughs a different shade, color-coded, so that America knows which end fits where. This is spray paint of which I speak, no ventilation no safety masks, lots of poor folks speaking various broken tongues, a guy from Poland with a ruptured disc lifting 50-pound boxes of defective parts, a Haitian so damaged by police interrogations that he flinches when you raise your arm too suddenly near, and all of us hating the job, knowing it's meaningless, yet singing, cursing, telling jokes, unentitled to anything 
but joy. The Lord, unreasonable joy that sometimes overwhelms you even in a hole like this. It's a joy rulers mistake for proof of the human spirit. I tell you, it is Kali, the great destroyer, her voice singing amidst butchery and hate. I tell you, it is Rachel, the inconsolable, weeping for her children. It goes both over and under the human spirit. It is my father crying in his sleep because he works 12-hour shifts six days a week and can't make rent. It is 110 degrees in the land of fake Christmas trees. It is Blanca Ramirez keeling over pregnant sans green card. It is a nation that has spiritualized shopping, not knowing how many lost to the greater good of retail. It is Marta the Packer rubbing her crippled hands with Lord's water and hot chilies. It is bad pay and worse diet and the minds of our children turned on the wheel of sorrow. No language to leech this from the blood. No words to draw it out. A fake Christmas tree spinning wildly in the brain. And who can stop it? Who? Unless grief grows a hand and writes this poem. Thank you.